Good evening. My name is Brinkley Messick. I'm a professor of anthropology and a member of the faculty collective at the Center for Palestine Studies. I would like to, like to welcome you to a screening by the center of Nizar Hassan's remarkable documentary, Tariq Sidi, My Grandfather's Path, or actually My Grandfather's Way is the official title, I believe. CPS is very proud to host the North American premiere of Tariq Sidi, a film that has been lauded as a Palestinian Iliad. It seems that this is Nizar Hassan's second filmic visit to Colombia. The first being in Dreams of a Nation, an innovative Palestinian film festival organized by our colleague Hamid Dabashi in 2003 that led to a volume of the same name edited by Hamid and prefaced by Edward Said, which appeared in 2006. And to which Nizar contributed a chapter. The festival in 2003 was part of a larger determined effort still ongoing to collect, catalog, digitize, and make available the products of the Palestinian filmic imagination. By my count, we have five of Nizar, Nizar Hassan's previous films in our Dreams of a Nation collection listed on the CPS website, whereas the filmography list in the rear of Dreams of a Nation book lists 12 works for him. So we have more to go. The Center for Palestine Studies itself was founded in 2010. We are thus in 2020 in the midst of celebrating the anniversary of our first full decade as the unique university-based center for Palestinian studies in the United States. In taking stock of our many pro programming achievements, we recognize the particular success of Palestine Cuts which is the name for the present film series, which has been supported since its launch in 2015 by our friends, Jean and Ken Levy Church. In addition to the advice and participation of Hamid, who is the Hagopian, Hagop Kavorkian professor in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies, who will engage with, in the Q&A with our filmmaker Nizar Hassan tomorrow evening, and who, by the way, this is Hamid, has a new book which is titled On Edward Said, that will be the focus of a discussion next Tuesday with Ahadaf Soeif, a link for which can be found on Eventbrite. I would like also to recognize the regular collaborations over the years of our colleagues, James Seamus and Richard Pena, distinguished faculty members both at the Columbia University School of the Arts film program. From Nizar Hassan, we have learned that the story of his filmic career goes back to a movie theater, the Cinema Diana, in 1960s Nazareth. Among other distinguished alums of childhood movie, movie going at the Diana and viewings of Western films, including Westerns, are several other Nazareth natives, including Hani Abu Asad, who mentioned the importance of, this, of his first film experiences at that cinema in his CPS masterclass the video of which is on the center's website. Nizar Hassan's academic training culminated in an, uh, an MA in anthropology from Haifa University. As he told us, the PLO beckoned at one point in his youth, but he turned to filmmaking. He is a freelance filmmaker, director, and scriptwriter who has also taught his craft at the university level. The work we are about to see is based on years of research and hiking. As has been announced, Tarek Sidi will be, sc be screened in two parts, with the final hour and the following Q&A to be presented tomorrow evening, December 2nd, again starting at 6 p.m. Finally, on a note that will be repeated tomorrow by Hamid, audience questions should be entered via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. We will be stopping the film uh, after uh, um, at, at a moment, I think it's at 8.30 roughly, and we will finish the, the last hour and then have the Q&A with, with the filmmaker, which is our practice tomorrow the, on December 2nd. Welcome to all. Hi, Nizar, can you hear me? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, 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 Ahlan. Uh, do you see me? Do you see me yeah, too? Yeah. I see you and I can hear you. 
but I wanted to hear more. I wanted to hear more Om Kulsum singing. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listen, uh, <clears throat> the way that this Zoom has been organized, we can't see the audience, uh, but I can tell you that there are scores of people uh, uh, watching, and it has been a spectacular success. And uh, First and foremost, Nizar, let me welcome you back to Colombia. We welcomed you to Colombia exactly 17 years ago. We were both much younger uh, when, you right. first came, when you first came to Colombia. However, virtually, uh, I very much hope very soon we can welcome you back in person uh, to teach master classes, to meet our students and our colleagues. Uh, let me first begin by thanking my colleagues for Center for Palestine Studies that is, uh, ha has been now in operation for 10 years. This is the first decade. And thank uh, my colleagues Brink and Simon for organizing this. It has taken a, a while. And uh, also thank two of my colleagues in the School of the Art uh, Film Division School of the Arts, James Seamus and Richard Pena. They are part of the collective that we have uh, here at Columbia and help us with our film uh, events. Uh, Nazar, uh, I want to jump into your film because we have audience and they want to ask a question. And perhaps the question on mind of everybody is for you to share with us uh, the origin of this project. How did you conceive of this project? Uh, and what were some of the uh, logistical issues that you may have had that we just don't see them in terms of traveling along the path of your grandfather, various parts of uh, Palestine? Uh, and uh, also something about the creative process from the moment that you were shooting the films and then when you were editing it, and the length of the film that now, fortunately, we were able to see the entirety of it. So talk to us uh, a little bit from the conception of the project. How did it begin and how did it unfold? Um, first of all, I uh, should uh, you know, thank, thank Al Jazeera documentary because it's a production of Al Jazeera documentary. And I'm very, very proud that finally I could fulfill a dream that, you know, sort of, uh, a work like this could be really um, Arab production, uh, high quality, and uh, whatever. So I really would like to thank the people of Al Jazeera documentary. Um, you know, sort of, um, a, uh, it's the, 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 the idea evolved. Um, there was many, many, you know, sort of reasons uh, how it evolved, and uh, I, I I could write really a book about it, but um, there is a question that I ask 24 hours every day, and I really mean it. How did we lost Palestine? That's the most painful thing, you know. I I am angry. I'm, I can't see anybody right now. Uh, hello. Yeah, uh, I'm here. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, sort of, how did we lose Palestine? Why did we lose Palestine? And um, um, I'm angry, I'm worried. I can't believe that this uh, thing had happened. And uh, uh, the second thing is, you know, sort of, we fighting for what? You know, sort of, okay, we fight for liberation. Um, first of all, liberating the Palestinian. Uh, uh, women and men. Uh, uh, but um, there is a, they call it everything. They call it uh, issue. They call it narrative. They call it territory. They call it a map. Uh, it's none of those things. It's a home. And I wanted to feel and live my home. And the most horrible thing 
is that I can't leave my home. Because there is a colony being established, you call it the State of Israel, to me it's a colony. And um, there is a colonizer that have a set of narrative that this is their, you know, map and their country and their state. And this is, uh, you know, they inherited from some, someone or from God, I don't know. So I really wanted to understand, and this film is to understand things. And there's a lot of things that I understand them first time while I was making the film. While I'm, when I say while I was making the film, means start the research. Mm. The research of hiking, I started actually almost uh, nine years ago. Nice. I decide, I worked a lot outside Palestine, and uh, I decide that's it. I can't, uh, you know, go outside Palestine anymore, and I want to know and feel the body. The, the, I, I, I wanted to know the relationship between me and this home. Mm. Everywhere, mainly Palestinians, talk about Palestine, but I never, never knew any Palestinian who know more than the area that he knows if not only the village. So I wanted to know my home. And that when I discovered the record of my uh, father to my grandfather, and we were a very proud family because uh, our grandfather established something unique in this village called Mashhad and um, uh, you know, sort of, I, I, I have to say also, one of the things that the colonialists do systematically is to disconnect you from your grandfather because your grandfather is Palestine or Wilayat Beirut or the Ottoman Empire or the Arab world. And that's a primitive. That's backward. That's, you know, when Palestine was empty, empty, <laughs> you know? And that's when, sorry? And that's Nothing when, more. that's when you don't have anything almost. And then when I heard my father, grandfather tape, I realized that, you know, sort of all, there's a more than Palestine. His, home is Wilayat Beirut, it's extended to Beirut. So I start understanding that one of the most dangerous thing is to Palestinize Palestine. To Palestinize Palestine is to make a map, to turn home to a map, to take, to make the home to a narrative, the reality called home, the relationship between a person and his home is um, a narrative. And that's drives me crazy, you know, so I'm not a narrative. The, 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 the history, my history is not a narrative. And uh, my struggle is not a narrative. And uh, I, I was wondering why I have to convince all the time the colonialists that they have that they have the right to live in my homeland and that this is my homeland. I have to organize myself how to liberate myself, not to you know sort of I of probably of course I have to explain to him also that we can live together and all this thing. But I think this is something that I don't want to talk about it unless colonialism stopped and colonialists will agree that this is my homeland and we can live together uh, without Zionism and colonialism. So please don't ask me, that, uh, anyone ask me about this question because I'm not gonna answer it, okay? Um, so uh, I, um, I uh, love my home because I don't think that it's, uh, it's uh, you know, the most, beautiful place in the world. It's heaven because it's home. Everybody thinks that his home is heaven. So it's heaven. It's beautiful. And it's mine. 
and I love it, you know, so, and I have a very intimacy, even erotic relationship to this, to this place, you know, okay. and when uh, I hike, and I still hike. Nizar, I was going to ask yes. you exactly the, the point you made earlier, that uh, Palestine has become, you criticize, that Palestine has become a narrative, has become a metaphor, and rarely even Palestinians have seen the way that you just showed them the entirety of the landscape of Palestine, one Palestinian walking from one end to another. What was the effect of this on you yourself? Because you, uh, presumably this is the first time that you did it yourself as well. Uh, at, the no. end of, uh, at the end of shooting the film, how did it transform your own conception of Palestine? No, 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 no. I, 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 I uh, hugged Palestine much, much, much before, seven years, ten years before this thing. And uh, I hugged Palestine according to my uh, grandfather, Bath or Wayne. Uh, and uh, the way I used when I was a kid. I, when I was a kid also, I used to hike, but we never called it hiking. You know, we always, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, went to, 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 to hug the mountains. Every time I see a mountain, I go crazy. I have to climb there because this is mine. I have to, to be there. So um, the, 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 the thing, the most crazy thing about it, about this film is, this film is a criticism of the Palestinians. It's not a criticism of uh, anything else because, you know, sort of, I told you, I don't want to Palestinize Palestine. Palestine is a homeland and there is no argument over this. There is a fight, but not an argument. And there is no compromise. There is a dialogue where we can live together or whatever, you know, sort of. But, um, you know, there is a word in, uh, in Arabic called mabhur. Mabhur, I don't know how you translate it, but it's really seeing the, the, the colonialist, the European, the Zionist, wow, they are so, you know, amazing. So, you know, sort of uh, those two guys who travel to, to make a report about, you know, Palestine, they were really amazed by Zionism. Amazed by European, European, they studied also in the Sorbonne. Uh, the character uh, Rashid in uh, the novel of, uh, of Herzl. Uh, you know, I, I, I talked about a lot of people, uh, Palestinians or uh, people of, uh, uh, of uh, Ottoman Arabs or uh, Arabs who live here, how they were really, um, you know, this guy, um, I don't want to mention his uh, family name because maybe it will create a lot of problem right now, who was the mayor of Jerusalem, who went and agree with the Zionist and the English colonialists that this land belonged to the Jews. Uh, sorry, to the Zionist. There's a huge difference between both uh, uh, realities. Okay, how come? You know, and there's many articles, mainly non-Palestinian articles, how those guys, you know, were uh, uh, amazed and uh, mabhurim. I hope if anybody knows the, how to translate this to English, uh, can translate it. This film against this mabhurim people, and those mabhurim people, they call them in Palestine muthakafun and uh, educated, and uh, that's the problem of the Palestinian cinema, because the Palestinian cinema all the time want, it's a descriptive to describe our reality to the West. It's not to analyze our reality, to criticize ourselves and to shock ourselves uh, uh, and making a film you know, to understand reality in order to change it. No, it's to describe um, poor reality, victim reality, asking for help and charity. And uh, 
Uh, Nizar, we have some questions that I want to incorporate them from the audience. Uh, as you know, uh, this is the uh, premiere of your film in United States, and hopefully it will be seen by others uh, more in US, in Europe, and so forth. One of the questions that now is asked is, has any thought been given to creating a study guide for the film? Uh, with maps and historical data, namely the way that you were yes. looking, yeah, looking at maps. So there are Palestinians who live in the US, or there are Palestinians who live in Latin America. And when they watch it, they would be good to see uh, alongside with maps, with historical data, et cetera, that they can follow the, the, your, the, your story as you move on from your parents, from your grandfather. Yeah, I wanted to, 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 say two things. One, it was in purpose that we don't want to make it like an, uh, like an educational uh, film. So we show the map and we travel from here to here by the map and things like this. Because films is an emotional statement. I use this data, uh, which is, you know, academic and historical data, to enforce the emotional reality, but not the academic or uh, this reality. Second, I wanted not to put a map and things like that because in home you don't use map. You know, then, <laughs> then this is not a film for us home. You have to see the reaction of Palestinian living in Palestine to this film. It's unbelievable. You know, unbelievable. None of them, none of them mention why there is no map or et cetera, et cetera. Second, I don't believe in this Palestinian map. And in, in purpose, I talked all the time about Wilayat Beirut, Beirut province. That's the homeland of my grandfather. And I think this is the biggest one that colonialism had made in, 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 in Bilad Shan. See? Now, in terms of all the information, in terms of all the studies, uh, I really still trying to raise some money to build a website for the film where you can see all the references. I don't have them. That's the, the, the only problem. Well, uh... <laughs> this film, um, I really have to say that this film made with, with, with you know, sort of the budget of this film in America, it's for 10 minutes. The budget of this film in the colony called Israel, it's a budget of half hour film. And with this, I have to go and make this film. And I know, you know, sort of how much I invested and et cetera, et cetera. And that's it. That's the reality. And I don't think if I can make any other film because I don't want, you know, sort of, it's impossible. It's really impossible. So um, all the time they ask to do this and that. Unless you want to make films that the European want them to explain to them the way they want, or Americans or Western, the way they want to see, you know, this uh, homeland as an issue or narrative. Uh, the, the distinction, uh... Nazar, that you make between uh, a film that is not with map and for uh, uh, for explaining things to uh, non-Palestinians uh, or even non-Arabs is quite evident. <coughs> this is a, a emotional film. This is a personal film. This is a, a film by a Palestinian claiming his homeland. Uh, one question that I just saw somebody has asked is the impact of walking that you opted to walk as opposed to drive or as opposed to uh, any other uh, mechanism? Uh, uh, what, what, what was the impact of walking and also having your, uh, your sound engineer walk with you and having natural uh, yeah. uh, sound design? Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, first of all, you know, sort of, I don't know if it's a good metaphor or not a good metaphor, of, but I thought that this is Don Quixote, you know, 
<laughs> That's what I thought about it when the sound injury. The second thing, you know, I always show the crew in my film to tell that there is no documentary, that there is no, you know, all this objectivity, nothing. And I don't think we have to live in an objective reality. We have to live in an interactive reality, in an emotional reality, in a lively reality. So uh, in, in, in this sense, you know, that's why I thought, you know, sort of uh, the sound uh, engineer uh, should be uh, uh, with me, you know, mainly uh, Don Quixote, yeah? In terms uh, of uh, cars, you know, sort of, sorry. I just want to wonder how, how far are you willing to carry the metaphor of Don Quixote and your sound engineer is Sancho Panza. Uh, so is your claiming Palestine quixotic is just imaginary, delusional? No, the film, the film making this way, the, the making films this way is a Don Quixote. I see. Not I see. The claiming Palestine because claiming Palestine is absolutely not dependent in, in, in those, you know, sort of uh, elite and educated. It's dependent on people that I meet every day. I, I, I'm, I'm living in, a, I went back and I live in my home village. And I see the people here, you know, it's a total different perception and reality than talking to, you know, sort of uh, people who want to explain all the time our, our case. I'm not the case. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, you're Nazar Hassan. Uh, Nazar, I have a question from our friend and colleague, Nadia Yaqub. She, uh, she uh, curated a, a film fe festival for us last year on Gaza, themes that had to do with Gaza. And her question regards your aesthetic choices that you made, specifically your choice regarding pacing, editing, uh, camera focus on you and your crew, etc. In other words, I want to add to that, how much of this was scripted and how much of it you, you did during the editing? It's all scripted. There is nothing that it's not scripted. Scripting, script things is not to write down script. In, 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 I don't write, I write really some notes, but all the script, all of it in my head and the, where the camera stands, uh, the size of the frame, uh, the movement, everything is what we call um, uh, shooting uh, script. Everything, everything, you know, sort of, in one point when I uh, see that the crew don't understand because the crew is the first time doing something like this or a documentary or a fiction film, uh, I really uh, made, you know, sort of, I start drawing to them the size of the frame, the composition, everything, everything is scripted. And I don't believe that there is anything that it's not scripted. The thing is that whether your script works or not work, most of the films, <clears throat> you know, in documentary, if they are films, works. But I think most of, there is, not most, but, Many think that documentary is journalism. Even they conceptually, you know, sort of uh, separate between journalism and cinema, documentary, I think they don't understand how this function while you making the film. So this is, this is for me fiction, you know, this is for me fiction, you know, sort of, when you ask a camera, when you ask the sound man to walk next to you, and this is the main scene, and this thing is not a documentary. It's not journalism in the sense of course. journalism. I ask him and I ask him to do it like this. And, and I ask him, you know, sort of while we were filming, we filmed, let us say, uh, a long shot of the sea or a mountain. I asked the cameraman then to stop, cut and uh, film the, the face, like in point of views and things like that. And I put them together in the editing. And this is, <clears throat> this is definitely, you know, I wanted to say something. Go for it. Me, 
No, I say the film is, is my say. I wanted to tell something and I wanted to tell it the way I know how to tell things, okay? So it's, it's almost fiction. Of course it's fiction. Uh, Nazar, could you talk about, uh, talk about how many days you shot, how many t days it took for you and what was the ratio between your rushes and uh, the, the final film? Uh, so we have some understanding of that proportion. Yeah, uh, you know, sort of in terms of days, it's went uh, up to 60, more than 60 days. Uh, in terms of um, um, ratio, it was uh, problematic because, uh, you know, sort of I did not work with an experienced crew because of the budget, because of everything. So actually I functioned as the editor, the DP, the sound designer, everything sort of, uh, I, you know, sort of those. So it, it's, there's many, many rushes that are not useful and that um, <clears throat> it's a painful thing that I really kind of uh, don't want to talk about it. Uh, because, you know, when I looked at the rushes, I, uh, I almost, you know, I was crying for days, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, and also in terms of editing, it was hell, you know, because, you know, sort of to put things together and uh, many things. In terms of um, the research, it was two years of research. Research was... You know, the seven, eight years of hiking, I made them for, you know, commissioning this film. Then for two years, I just was reading almost 200 books. I don't know how many, really, I don't know how many articles, but a lot. And going also <clears throat> into, uh, Second hand, the Zionist libraries and archives and things like that. And uh, that was the main, uh, you know. And then go back to the same places that I hike with the new information. You know what I mean? <coughs> One of the information that I discover in the, one of the facts that I discover in the research was. Uh, the, the relationship between the Templars, te Templars and the Zionists. Even Ashkenazi, it's not, uh, you know, they, 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 they are all students. They are not Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi mean Germans. And the Templars call, being called Ashkenazis, i.e. I, I, uh, Germans. So uh, they were adopted by the, uh, this relationship is the most important thing that I discover, Angel Angelican and uh, Protestant and uh, things like that. And uh, there is one part that I did not include in the film, the, the Arab Protestant and Angelican, that uh, one of them is uh, Taufik Kenan, that uh, it's, it's problematic, very, very problematic, but it needs really a, a separate film because the, there was a massacre in Nazareth also between the Protestant and the, on one hand and the, the Latin in 1817, I think, and the way, you know, Angelican used Christians to control this, uh, our homeland. Uh, so that's really, uh, I, I encourage people to make uh, research about it. It's very, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, Nezar, I know that uh, the film has been shown on Al Jazeera documentary, and I assume the Palestinians have seen it. I have read some extraordinary reviews of it. Somebody has even called it Iliad of Palestine, Palestinian Iliad. But I wonder if you have shown it to a specifically Palestinian audience in Nazareth, in Nablus, uh, in Jerusalem, any, anywhere in particular, and how and what was the reaction? 
No, I, I, I made a premiere in Nazareth and uh, the, the reaction was amazing. I made the, the premiere for mainly uh, political activists and uh, working class people and family. <clears throat> and the next day, you know, on social media, there was an unbelievable reaction. It, it's, you know, sort of, I'm very, very happy with the success of this uh, film or series for Al Jazeera, it's a series documentary. Um, there, I did not show it in Nablus or any because of not, I don't know why, but I now can say because of the Corona. I'm not exactly, you know, I, I, I want to show this film to the masses. The masses saw this film. And uh, I know from phone calls, I know from, sometimes I can't walk in the street. You know, because, you know, yesterday this and before one month we saw you and we need to talk and amazing, amazing, amazing reactions. And the most important thing that make people have a self-confidence that this is home. They understood that they are mainly in Palestine, not in the West Bank and Gaza, in Palestine. Mainly, some people call them Israeli Arabs. Um, the sense that Wow, it's home. So we're not minority. We are the owners of the home. We are the, you know, the people of the home. That's the, the most important thing. For the yeah. West Bank, I don't know, but Gaza, I never, I don't, no, no, I did read in social media from the West Bank and, uh, but face to face, I never met any okay. of them because of uh, COVID. Uh, yeah, regarding Gaza, I want to ask you to, talk about the last scene where yes. you plant when you plant the camera right uh, when when you and your crew yeah, are, yeah, looking at, yeah, are looking yeah. at Gaza and then yeah. uh, one of you crosses the camera goes one way and the three of you get away from uh, from the camera and the camera sta stands there and there is this kind of uh, longing to, to go to Gaza and but you don't go to Gaza could you talk about that scene that last scene yeah, but it's the longing to go also to, to, to Beirut, where my father and, uh, you know, sort of uh, north of Palestine, the, the, they call it south of uh, Lebanon now, when we were in the fence and longing also to, to cross. And also when I was crossing, you know, and watching the, the border with Jordan, and I said the people used to come and go freely. So it's the same thing. What I'm trying to say, you know, by this thing that, you know, sort of, um, what Palestine you're talking about? You know, the one that extend to Beirut or Hashem, because my grandfather talk about Hashem or to Amman or to Gaza or, you know, sort of, and the size, you know, if we continue like this, the size of Palestine, which is Palestinizing Palestine, will be, I think, you know, maybe, maybe Nablus, uh, not Nablus, Ramallah. You know, mm. <clears throat> so uh, it's it's not about Gazi or only. It's nice. it's about you know uh, the map. It's about mm. the the dangers of the map. About the dangers of talking about territory. It's the it's like you know exactly like uh, humanity until the capitalism used to talk about home as home. Now we use we talk about it as real estate. You know, yeah. so home is not a real estate. Home is not a territory. Home is not a map. Home is not a geography. Home is a place where, because of this, I, you know, film give me the freedom to talk about it because it's a emotional state. You know, when I climb, climb a mountain, it's uh, wow, here. Yeah, and then when I got to the top and all of a sudden, you know, I see Marj bin Amir, I see, you know, all of, uh, you know, all of uh, what they call uh, Lebanon now. When I see, you know, endless, endless landscape, it's my home. You know, nobody can take it from me. They can kill me. They can rape me. They can kill my family, they can destroy my home, they can call everything, but they will never, never, never can kill the love I have to my homeland. 
And the feeling, unbelievable feeling and confidence to my homeland and that this is Palestine and I will liberate it because I want to liberate myself. To liberate Palestine doesn't mean that people who live here have to go away or whatever, you know? And the other thing, why if I talk like this, I'm a criminal? I love my home. And I want it. And somebody stole it from me. Doesn't matter what is the reason for that. If he was here 5,000 or 10,000 or there was a Holocaust or whatever, this is my home, I want it. End of story, come kill me. Kill me anytime you want, destroy, yeah, destroy. You can, you can kill me, you can destroy it, but this is my home, I don't wanna, sh no. I can share it with you even, I mean, with anybody, but I don't wanna give it to anyone. No one can take it. No one can take it. And I love it. It's the most beautiful place in the world because it's home, not because it's the most important door, I don't know, it's home. And when Palestinians wanna talk about this, please, please don't talk about the issue. Come visit it and see. It's more beautiful than New York, trust me. Uh, there, is a, there is a comment, uh, Nazar, by uh, one of our uh, friends who, who, who has watched it. I want to turn it into a question. But first, the comment. Here's the comment. I loved how you didn't narrate walking over the underneath, uh, over and underneath the numerous barbed fences you crossed in the film, especially in the beginning. It was as if you just walked through them. There was a kind of matter of factness about the refusal to acknowledge those boundaries as barriers that would prevent your connection to land and hikes across Palestine. I thought that was powerful. Uh, not sure it is a question, but my, I want to turn it into a question. Is it a, is a, is a, something that we observe that you just roam through Palestine, you and your crew, and you claim it and you tell the story of your grandfather and in a way, your interlocutor are also your grandchildren. You're telling the story of grandfather for your grandchildren, namely there is a posterity. But were there logistical issues when you were actually shooting the film, uh, going from cities into an, another city, from uh, various parts of your, of your uh, journey? Were there logistical issues by, with the securities, with uh, police, with the army, things of that sort? If there was one time, you know, sort of the army, when we came to that place, our uh, location, uh, between the so-called uh, uh, the colony, Israel, state of Israel, and the so-called also Hashemite kingdom, El uh, Makura. So for them, it's uh, <clears throat> it's a place where you can't cross unless you have a permission, and we did have a permission. Not only me have to have a permission, every filmmaker, doesn't matter is, uh, you know, who is he, have to have a permission, but we solve it. Uh, <clears throat> then there is a scene that I did not include it, going uh, uh, some, something like, um, I think 12 kilometer in the, in the wall that separate Palestine North and East or Palestine 48, what they call for Palestine 48 and the West Bank. And the, when, once we got to the end of it, we, uh, the soldier came. They were very friendly, actually. Um, no, there wasn't, you know, sort of, nobody, don't think about those things. The obstacle is not those obstacles. <laughs> Palestine, you know, Israeli never uh, Zionist Israelis. Not, it's 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 really a democracy, you know. Hey, democracy, yes, 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 free speech, everything, but it's occupation and colonialism. So we don't have those kind of obstacles of uh, you know. And also, to tell you the truth, there is. Uh, problems, but I don't like to talk about them because you know, like. Like 
I'm not very, I, I know that, you know, I'm a Palestinian under colonization, under occupation, and probably it's nature that some problems will, but they are not crucial. Uh, Nazar, let me ask you now, uh, we see you in your home with your library behind you. Tell us about uh, what is the life of a Palestinian filmmaker in Nazareth? Beginning by what is it with Nazareth? Is it in the air? Is it in the water? All these magnificent Palestinian filmmakers come from Nazareth. I lost you. I'm here. Are you? Can you hear me? Hamid, I lost you. Oh, okay. And I Nazareth, hear you. So please, please. Okay. I ask I it wonder. Again. Yeah. I wonder if you could share with us what is the life of a Palestinian filmmaker these days in, uh, in Palestine, in Nazareth? What do you do? What do you study? What do you teach? What is your next project? How do you anticipate going to film festivals? How do you connect with your uh, audiences in Palestine or outside Palestine? Just talk about your, uh, your place as a Palestinian filmmaker and how you connect to the rest of Palestinians, both in diaspora or in Palestine, and with, with your life as a professional filmmaker. How can you travel freely? Can you connect to your colleagues freely? Talk about that. Um, first of all, you know, sort of, uh, this is my office. It's part of my, uh, so part of my home. Um, I can only talk about my experience now. Uh, you know, sort of uh, in, in 2000 uh, with Anne-Marie Jasser, we were sitting down in a coffee shop. And before that, I started with the other colleague. And I said, we have to boycott, to make the boycotting, you know, all those events that uh, show, um, Always, at that time, they always wanted to have event, Israeli-Palestinian cinema events all over the world. <coughs> and um, uh, so we have to boycott all those events and we have to start saying loudly, enough with all those things and enough with people not recognizing us as independent filmmakers. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing, I talked to her about the fact that when I uh, proposed one of my films to uh, a European station, it was Channel 4, and Art, they told me that they had enough Palestinian films. So I was shocked because, you know, I didn't know that much of Palestinian films. So I asked them to send me the, the list. So all were made by Israelis, Eyal Sivan, and all these guys that, you know, sort of, we love to love, you know. So I said, they are not, they are Israelis. If they have, you know, sort of uh, supporting uh, freedom and things like, it doesn't mean that they are Palestinians. So <clears throat> I, that time, stopped asking any uh, money from any uh, institution, uh, Zionist institution supporting films. Then I learned that European and Zionist is not that different. And uh, so I decided personally not to finance my films by RT or any other European or American. And I start with Al Jazeera. So I made five films actually with Al Jazeera and um, the, the, the most important thing is also that I wanted to make those films to provoke Palestinians. <clears throat> I don't want any, you know, I, you know, you can make films that the world support you or Europe support you, whatever. I wanted to provoke ourselves, us and the Arab world, Syrian, Lebanese, Egyptian, etc., 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 to create a discourse, a new discourse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, with this choice, I'm not sure that I can make the next film. I'm sitting down here, I don't know if I can make the next film. I never knew, you know, when I worked with Europe and the, the Israelis, I knew the formula how to continue making films. 
but uh, that formula is something that uh, coming to oppress me and oppress my uh, emotions and oppress my reality. So I don't want it. I don't want to explain to any German that, you know, sort of I am with peace and only want a, a small state next to Israel, you know, or uh, whatever. So... Uh, <coughs> Nazar, do you, do you anticipate, do you uh, envision uh, sometime soon, the rise, the emergence of pa independent Palestinian uh, producers and, and uh, institution that will finance the independent of Israel, independent of Europe, independent of uh, no, Jazeera. No, no, do you, no, you, no. No, because it's not the question of money. It's a question of how do we, how we perceive ourselves, how we think, what is, what, what, what do we want? You know, I think most of the Palestinian cinema and the intellectual are middle class. And the only middle class that they can enter, enter is the European, inter, uh, European or Western middle class. So by this, you know, they, that it's, it's a question of consciousness. It's not a question of money because, you know, with this really 10 minutes budget, American, I made three and a half hours uh, with a lot of problems and uh, it's, it's going on, but I made the film. It's not a question of money. It's important, the question of money, but it's a question of consciousness. You know, sort of, uh, I don't want to say, I really could succeed. I really could succeed in Europe and America. And uh, one day maybe I write my memories and I write who offer me what? And I could now be one of the, I don't know what, I don't want. I'm a political person. I want to liberate myself. And I want to liberate cinema. For me, cinema is an aesthetic statement, beautiful. I love cinema. I can't live without cinema. But cinema is insignificant if it's not a political uh, instrument to liberate a human being. As an individual, or group or nation or whatever you, you, you call it. And with this vision, I don't think, you know, sort of, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about, you know, Palestinian cinema, if there is a Palestinian cinema, because I'm not sure there is a Palestinian cinema, there is a Palestinian filmmakers, but Palestinian cinema in terms of producers and audience, I'm not sure about it, you know? Well, I'm sure about it because I, I wrote a book on Palestinian cinema. I in know which you that. Have a <laughs> in which you have a chapter. So you can't tell me that there is no Palestinian. But, but Nazar, let me ask you one final question because we're running out of time. What about- and I want to go you... to sleep. I want to go yeah, to exactly. sleep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but this one, just one quick question, Nazar, which is concerning the new technology, the new digitized uh, uh, media that we have. Has that have any uh, impact, digital camera, digital filming, digital, uh, I mean, right now you can make a film on your iPhone. Have, uh, have those, uh, or watch a movie on iPhone, right? Right now I'm having this conversation with you and many of our friends have watched your film on their laptop or iPad or even iPhone. Have these technological changes uh, had any effect on your uh, creative mind in terms of how films can be made, especially as a political, uh, as an art of protest? Um, still from the old generation who went to cinema and was in ecstasy when he saw the big screen and we went out and talk about Fellini and we talk about Scorsese and we talk about those. So I still think in a big screen, um, I don't know. I really don't know, but I can tell you, you know, sort of when I make films, I make films as a big screen, not as a video, not as an iPhone, <clears throat> not as a small screen, not as a, um, I'm, I'm making films like the old days, you know, my set of mind, you know, like, uh, that's how I make films. This is why you see me, you know, with those three hours going, wow, you know, sort of, landscape and long shots and you know the, the, the characters looking for small do details and information to find their self and uh, you know sort of a lot of emotions 
Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I can't answer. Maybe I refuse to answer this because I don't want to admit that the new reality is coming and I'm soon going to say goodbye and, you know, other will make films now. Yeah. Uh, well, as you know, I, uh, I'm even more a fanatical uh, antiquarian. I'm 10 years older than you. So however fanatical you are about old-fashioned cinema, I'm that and even 10 years older. Uh, I want to thank you, Nizar. First and foremost, Again, I, uh... I want to thank you for sending me the film, for allowing me the pleasure of sitting and watching it in one go for three and a half hours. I want to thank you for allowing us to premiere it here in the United States. I want to thank you for the magnificent body of work that you have produced uh, since the early 90s. Uh, you are a magnificent filmmaker. You are a, a privilege to know. And very, very much on behalf of my colleagues and friends and audience here at Columbia and in New York and across the country who have joined us, I very much hope that we, and we plan physically, inshallah, soon to bring you to Columbia to teach in person a master class and even a course a semester if you can afford it. Uh, take good care of yourself, go back to sleep, stay safe, and uh, social distancing and mask and all of that, and inshallah soon. Thank you, Nizar, for being with us.